Well, good evening. Um, my name is Stefan Dörkon. I'm here, a professor in the University of Oxford, and I'm very glad to uh, be able to introduce the speaker for tonight. Um, professor Richard Baldwin is the professor of international economics at the Graduate Institute of Geneva. Uh, he's the ex-president of the Center for Economic Policy Research, the EPR, and the editor-in-chief of the a uh, really interesting economic policy portal, uh, www.voxeu.org. Um, he's, you know, well-known advisor of governments, of international organizations, written numerous books, uh, academic articles on themes of trade, globalization, regionalism, European integration. Um, today, he will be talking about his latest book, The Globotics Upheaval, Globalization, Robotics and the Future of Work, which was published last month by OUP. Um, maybe to add, you know, he has been very involved in the policy space, uh, for example, including as a senior staff economist of the President's Council of Economic Advisors in the Bush administration. Um, he is um, an elected member on the Council of the European Economic Association for a particular period of time, so academically very distinguished. He was a visiting professor at Oxford uh, for many years as well, and the vice chair of the Academic Advisory Committee of the Peterson Institute for International Economics uh, for four years as well. Very distinguished uh, think tank. Um, I think you will just enjoy his talk because um, with all his academic credentials, this is something that is looking forward, which academics rarely dare to do. Um, and that's what makes it exciting. And I hope you enjoy it. Um, he's told me he will speak for maybe 45 minutes. Uh, there will be plenty of time for question and answers. And, I'll, and I hope you'll be stimulated and excited and maybe a little bit skeptical at times. And that's what we want. So uh, uh, Richard, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Stefan, for those um, very kind introductory remarks. And I want to thank you and the Oxford Martin School for giving me this possibility to share my ideas with a very important audience. I, I don't know if um, Frey and Osborne are actually in the audience. Are they here? OK, there we go. OK, so we have some of the original uh, uh, s stimulants of this debate about automation, at least. <clears throat> um, what I want to do is start by explaining why I wrote this book. Um, now, those of you who are academics in the audience realize that when even the author has to explain why he wrote the book, um, it's probably a book that, could, that the world could have done without. Um, now, maybe you will, uh, you know, agree with that by the end, but give me about 45 minutes to try and convince you that there's something in here that's, um, sorry, this, I, got to, I forgot to put it on flight mode. Uh, I never get calls, except when I'm standing here. <laughs> okay, so this was supposed to be a book about the future of globalization, which would have been a natural move for me. My last book came out in the end of 2016, and it talked about the past, the current globalization, and the last chapter was about future globalization. I presented that all over the world and had hundreds of super interesting conversations with very, very different people, and all I was going to do is write up those conversations and call it a book. But then I started doing research, and three things uh, really struck me. Um, that there was a, something of a systematic misthinking about what was going on. The first is, it's about the service sector. But many, many people, both when they talk about globalization and automation, are thinking about the manufacturing sector. Because that's what globalization and automation were for the last 25 years, if not three centuries. So if you were using real data about automation or globalization, you were talking about the manufacturing sector, and that's misunderstanding where this thing is going. That's the first thing. The second is I think it's coming faster than most people know or believe, and in ways very few people expect. And it, since it's going to affect white collar, service, office, and professional workers, they are not ready for it. So I think there's something, uh, a bit of an alarmist issue here, that people are not ready for what's coming. It's coming at a, a much faster pace than they expect. And that, I think, is a problem. 
the third thing, well, actually, I forget the third thing, but it was really important. So um, <laughs> it'll probably come out as I talk. Okay. That's actually a joke, but <laughs> you guys got it. This is being Oxford. Okay. Let me start with this. Uh, and as Stefan said, this is a talk about the future. So I always like to put up this slide to say that uh, the future is unknowable, but also inevitable. Now, the fact that it's unknowable means that by definition, what I'm talking about is making it up. And I'm going to try and use logic and analogy and, and history to help me make it up. But don't write down what I say will happen. Listen to the logic of what I'm doing to make those predictions, because all of us will have to make those predictions. And you have a responsibility to think about the future, because it is inevitable. Whether you think about it or not, it will come, and I think it's probably worthwhile thinking harder than what's going on. But it also means that, who knows? We're, ta we're talking probabilities and possibilities. Who knows what's going to happen? And I don't actually do any original research trying to predict the future, as, as uh, Frey and Osborne and others have done. I, I survey them all, and I realize that they go from no problem at all, it'll just be more the same, to kind of explosive, we ought to do something about this. And, and we just have to admit that there's, these possibilities exist. OK, let me start with definitions. Globotics. Globotics is an ugly but hopefully memorable word that smashes together globalization and robotics. And the reason I use this ugly word, and actually several, several of my reviewers have gone out of their way to point out how ugly this word is, um, <laughs> is that you read almost every single day in the newspapers and in your news feeds how AI is teaching robots, normally steel-colored robots, to do amazing things. But very few people have realized that digital technology is changing globalization at the same pace and affecting the same jobs as much of the automation is doing. So the idea that globalization is going to continue like global value chains and continuing like it was before, all about manufacturing. Do we lose the jobs? Is, is it automation? Is it globalization in the manufacturing sector? That's just dead wrong. And I want to sma smash into your minds, don't forget about globalization, because it's also changing. And when I talk about globalization in this book, without denying that globalization can be many, many things, um, I'm going to talk about telemigration. Or I'd like you to think of it as remote intelligence. And when I talk about robotics, I'm going to be talking about white-collar robots, or AI, of a particular type. Um, it was deeply annoying to me that many of the newspaper editors who did pieces uh, chose pictures of robots, physical robots, even though the whole point of my book is don't worry about the physical robots. But anyways, there you go. OK, telemigration. People sitting in one nation, working in offices in another. You can think of it as freelancing gone global, or telecommuting, but internationally, the gig economy gone global. There's lots of names for it. It's actually happening. Um, many, many people know about it, but they haven't realized how fast it's coming. Now, what I want to do then is because there's, there's a, actually a whole project here in, in Oxford called the iLabor Project. Is anybody here from the iLabor Project? Yes, OK. So the, you, you guys can, you know, do your emails for a few minutes. We're, we're going to go here. I'm going to show some videos to convince people that this is for real, and it's way bigger than you think, and it's growing faster than you can imagine. Um, but you, you guys can you know, close your eyes for a little while. OK, so this is the first one. Joseph, mo mostly it's not verbal, so you've got to read along, but it's in big things. This is from The Economist magazine. It's only one minute long.
So I hope you catch that. Kenyan economy is training a million workers to join this soon. That's just one country. Now here, that's what you'd call low-end telemigration. Uh, it, it's, it's relatively simple task. And, and Joseph, obviously, he's middle class because he owns a laptop in Kenya. So he, he's not the poorest of the poor. But having 10 jobs which pay a few dollars every week, that is a transformative for his lifestyle. This is a high-end uh, telemigrate. I'm Adrian McDermott, and I'm the Senior Vice President of Product Development for Zendesk. Zendesk is a cloud-based customer service platform. Currently, we have engineering teams in Copenhagen, Dublin, Melbourne, and Singapore. We have a large support presence in Manila. We had a need to build a team that focused on integrations and finding people with very diverse skills and knowledge of other people's software. The market in the Philippines in terms of developers is basically owned by Upwork. Everyone is either on Upwork or Upwork curious. It was clear to... So that's the high end, and it goes through a platform called Upwork. There's many, many of these things. Upwork went public uh, last year. It's worth $2 billion now. They process something like a billion dollars of freelancing revenue every year. It's growing at 20 30% per year. And there's many other platforms. It will end up eventually like eBay and Alibaba, but for services. But we don't know which one's winning yet. So those are examples of high and low end telemigration. Here's about white collar robots. These are the low end white collar robots. The most uh, popular and effective one is called robotic process automation. And if you've never heard of RPA, you really have to look it up because it's changing the world of work in offices in rich countries at an incredibly fast pace. The, one of the most well-known companies is Blue Prism, a British company, went public a couple of years ago, and they worked together with Ernst Young trying to get companies to replace workers with this robotic process automation. So this is what the robot looks like. It's a piece of software. And if you've ever done a macro in Word or Excel, this is what that does. So for example, I, I did a tour, in, a book tour uh, 10 days ago in the, in the US, and I sent an email to my provider, Swisscom, that I wanted to change the subscription service to have domestic calls in the United States. So somebody at Swisscom opened up that email, decided what I wanted to do, opened up the subscription database, changed my subscription, closed that database, opened up the financial database, changed my billing, closed that, and then moved on. This thing does exactly that in exactly the same way, using exactly the same software, but 100 times faster, and everything's recorded, so if there's a mistake, you can figure out what happened. And it does make some mistakes, but given it actually understands what I wanted from the email, it doesn't make mistakes. So this is rapidly replacing kind of more routine office work, uh, knowledge worker assembly line, which is ultimately before required a human because computers couldn't read emails. That was a, that was a big problem. This is high-end uh, white collar robots. This one is called Amelia, and you will not be able to resist calling it her, even though it's a piece of software. That would be like calling your favorite Excel spreadsheet, the one you keep track of your pension or on, on like her or him. But in any case, you can't resist it to personalize these things. Not all of them have uh, um, presentable avatars like this. Uh, one, another one that's quite well known is IBM's Watson, which is an AI platform, but there's many, many other platforms like this. And these are a substitute for a much higher level of thinking, because not only can they read, write, and do all that stuff, but they can recognize advanced patterns uh, in, in particular things. So they can help you look for inconsistencies in the thousand contracts that you've written for whatever it is, or look for fraud in the trucking department. So they have AI capacities, and it requires an AI genius to get these things going. The RPA, actually almost anybody can do it with a few hours of training, so it's, it's a completely different thing. Um, Amelia it plays a big role in my book. The book is a very you know, fast read. You read it in five hours, think about it for five weeks. That, that's what I'm hoping for. Um, but Amelia in the beginning, the middle, and the end. And if I forget to tell you the story of Amelia and Amanda, um, please remind me because it's a, it's a great story. Um, Amanda is the human who was the basis of the avatar. As you know, all these avatars have a real model where they take pictures of them for all sorts of things. And Amanda's there. Okay. 
So this time is different. So at this, about this point, um, many people, especially in an academic audience, are going, uh, well, what's different? You've just taken the old wine, put it in new bottles, invented a few labels to sell a few books, let's all have a drink and go home. Nothing new. Now, I was sympathetic with that before I started researching this book, uh, and I have come up with a series of intellectual infrastructure elements that help me believe that this time is not the same. This time really is different. And what I want to do in the next few slides is share with you how I'm thinking about this, uh, which convinced me that it's really different, and I hope to convince you that this time is different, and that's why you should be thinking differently about the future. The first thing is it's about service jobs, not factory jobs. And office and professional workers are unprepared for it. So generally speaking, office and service jobs were shielded from automation because computers couldn't think, or at least in, in sophisticated ways. And they were shielded from globalization, in other words, wage competition, because services were non-traded. Basically, it was hard to get service providers and service buyers in the same room at the same time. Um, but digital technology is tearing down that barrier to both automation of service jobs and globalization of service jobs, and is doing it at an explosive pace. These people feel sorry for these people. These people are in Swindon, and they're going to lose their job, but that's nothing new. They've been competing with robots at home in China abroad for decades, if not centuries, and they are used to it. These people feel sorry for them, but they think, I think they will get a brand new attitude when it starts displacing their jobs and leading them to downgrade what they can do. So it's important that it's service jobs. If nothing else, most of us work in service jobs. In a country like England, maybe 80, 90% of the people work in service jobs. So what happens in manufacturing? Well, that's sad and we feel for them, but it doesn't really move the dial for society. But if uh, even a few percentage of the service workers get displaced by either automation or globalization, that could lead to really big things. So I think that's the other aspect of services is distinguish sharply between what's going on in manufacturing and services, because the services is really what matters, and this is coming for services now. The second, Digitech is ICT. So one, I mentioned a lot of information and communication technology, ICT, in my old book, and I talked about Moore's Law and stuff. And, and when I started researching this one, I noticed everybody started talking about Digitech or digital technology instead of ICT. So what is the difference between the two? And I've convinced myself that there is a difference. So Deep down, they're the same thing. It's Moore's Law, Gilder's Law, Medcalf's Law, you know, the doubling of our ability to gather, process, uh, tra transmit, and store information. Every two years, that doubles. So that's explosive. But the difference is, is that ICT, at least for the concerns I'm talking about, was applied to manufacturing, which meant it was mostly a physical thing. But it was enabled by information and communication technology. So if just to make up a number, it's 80% physical, 20% infor information technology. Digital technology is being applied to services, which is mostly information and communication, and only a small part physical. So what that means is that the different physics applies. So when you talk about manufacturing and trading goods, you're talking about matter. And the laws of physics that apply to matter constrain economies in ways that, generally speaking, economists just skip over, but it conditions how fast things happen. Information, so the service sector is mostly about information, and so its mo development is controlled more by the, the physics of electrons and photons, which are completely different. So just to illustrate one way and it's completely different, is ask how fast would it take to double the flows of trade in goods? And the answer is if it was really fast, it would be two decades. The information flows have doubled every two years for the last 10 years and probably will double every two years for the next 10 years. So instead of two decades to adjust to doubling, you have two years. And it's because it's really a very, very different thing because it's information technology. Today's AI is different. In 2019, computers can read, write, see, speak, understand speech, create visual output, recognize subtle patterns. In 2015, they couldn't. So what changed? 
The way I think about it now is that programming is different. So most of you will have seen this book, Thinking Fast, Thinking Slow, which was an economist uh, grabbing one of the Nobel Prizes in economics by telling economists something that's very well known in psychology is that humans think in two different ways. We think slow, which is our logical conscious way. So like when you're trying to figure out a 15% tip on a restaurant bill, that's thinking slow. It's conscious, it's logical, it's effortful. You know you're doing it, and above all, you know how you're doing it. Therefore, you could write computer code that would teach a computer to do it. To write code in the old days, you needed to know what to do in every situation, logical step by logical step. Therefore, we could only teach computers to think slow. Whatever we knew how we thought about, we could teach them. But we didn't know, for example, how we recognize a cat in a photo. We didn't know how we walk over rough ground. Therefore, we could not teach computers to do that, thinking fast. So, you, for instance, you could be walking downstairs with your cell phone, watching a video, stumble, and you would recognize that that was a cat, catch your balance, all in, a, in an instant, without even thinking about it, without knowing how you did it. But if you tried to reproduce that with a supercomputer, it would be an incredibly complex act, complica complication in order to figure out what all your muscles should do, and at the same time, you were recognizing it was a cat in the video. Now, we couldn't do that before because we were programming computers with computer programs, and now we're using machine learning to program computers. So this is a brand new way of writing code, in essence, or I'd like you to think that way. So with machine learning, and that's the most important part of AI, if you're, if you're sort of new to the AI world, read about machine learning first. That's the one that's really uh, changing the way the world of work is in the next few years. So with machine learning, you get a very large database where the question is clear and the outcome is clear. And you get millions and millions of examples of where this was a question, this was the outcome. And then the AI geniuses use a variety of statistical techniques to estimate a very large statistical model, which is extremely nonlinear. And they use deep learning, neural networks, they have all sorts of terms for it. Those of you who are an economist in the, in the audience will recognize it as data mining, and you shouldn't do it in economics, but they're doing it with machine learning. But on a scale that you can't believe, they can take 100,000 pixels, put it in, and they estimate a model with thousands or tens of thousands of parameters. Now, once that's estimated, that's hard. Getting the data is hard. Estimating the model is hard. You need the geniuses for that. But once it's done, it's essentially a piece of computer code. You put it up on the model, you put the input in, it runs through its things, and it comes out with a guess. Dead easy to use. You, you, you can, anybody can use this thing once it's absolutely done. But the point is, it, the, even the AI geniuses don't know how this photo recognition is recognizing it as a cat because it's too complicated. You can't say this is what it was looking at. Just like us, we don't know how we recognize a cat's a cat. Now, the whole point of this is this unlocked cognitive capacities for computers that did not exist until machine learning got good enough and data sets got big enough. So there is a whole set of things computers can automate that they could not automate even in 2015, and that's changing the world both of automation and globalization. Digital disruption. Now, this is another one that surprised me. Um, if you read through these things, the laws that drive them, the most famous one is Moore's Law. How many of you have heard of Moore's Law process? Okay, everybody's heard it. Um, sophisticated audience. Um, now, that's been going on since Richard Nixon was president. No surprise. And, you know, it's varied between 18 months and two years, maybe two and a half years sometimes. But it's very predictable. And yet people get, find that it's unexpected all the time. They even have a name, digital disruption for it. The CEOs get fired, companies go bankrupt, uh, e economics departments get ups, ups, upset about the way things are changing. Uh, it's predictable but unexpected. And I was trying to think, how can we understand that it's predictable but unexpected? And this is the intellectual infrastructure piece that I put together to try and understand it. So I will assert that uh, taking progress on the vertical axis and years on the, on the uh, horizontal axis, 
that humans instinctively think about progress in a straight line fashion. So let me justify that. I got to read a lot of literatures doing this book. It was great fun. So I read about evolutionary psychology um, and uh, evolutionary sociology. And as it turns out, brains, all animal brains, evolved to track motion. And everything that moves has a brain. Everything that doesn't move doesn't have a brain. And there's even an animal called a sea squirt, which has a brain when it's young and is floating around. And as soon as it gets fixed, it eats its own brain because it doesn't need it anymore. I thought, I love that. I knew you guys would like that, but my editor made me take it out of the book. <laughs> in any case, that point is, is that our minds evolved to track motion in a walking distance world. And typically, we look at increments. Now here, I'm not talking about the thinking slow bit. I'm thinking about the thinking fast bit. So when you think about, is it likely that half the lorries in England will be driven by autonomous uh, computers in three years? You don't sit down with a calculator and try and do this. You instinctively think, nah, not possible. And what you're doing is you look what happened in the last three years or last one year, and you say, okay, maybe it'll be a little faster than that. But basically, you're kind of thinking instinctively that the next few years will be like the last few years in other words, the increments are equal. Equal increments, that's linear, straight lining. So I think there's a natural tendency to straight line the future when you think about what's going to happen using your gut. But that's not the way digital technology actually progresses. <laughs> it follows an exponential curve up until you hit diminishing returns, and then it follows this lazy S or logistical kind of curve. Now, what that means is that in the early days, our gut overestimates the impact. So you get people alarmist all the time. So you know we, we landed on the moon, and then people were talking about colonizing Mars like the next month. This was back in 1969. And uh, one car drives in a circle at the Las Vegas uh, electronics show, and everybody's talking about all the taxi drivers in the United States being unemployed. So we tend to straight line and like, oh, it's going to go so fast. But even though it's doubling, it starts such a small base, the increments are tiny, almost ignorable for a very long time until the base gets big. And then the increments get fantastically large. And people then underestimate the impact of technology, future out. Uh, and just to liven it up, I, I call that the holy cow moment. This is when it's predictable but unexpected. And actually, that, has, that, that observation has a name in technology. It's called a Mara's Law. And in economics, we have a name for it. When it comes to currency crisis, we call it Dornbusch's Law, which says crises take longer to come than you could imagine. But when they come, they come faster than you couldn't possibly expect it. And that's what's happening there, the holy cow moment of crises. In any case, um, just to kind of give an illustration of how fast we're talking about, and, and uh, there may be a lot of tech technologists here, so this will be, well, you guys can do your emails now. We'll, we'll take turns doing emails. Um, so this thing uh, is an iPhone 10X, and it came out in 2017, and it's two and a half times faster, the processing speed, than an iPhone 6S, which I used to have. And the iPhone 6S came out in 2015. Now, the iPhone 6S is faster than the mainframe computer that guided Apollo 11 to the moon and back in 1969. Do you know how much faster? Stop me when I get there. 10 times, 100 times, 1,000 times? 100 times. No, it's 120 million times faster. <laughs> and this one is two and a half times faster than that in two years. So what we're talking about is between 2015 and 2017, processing speed increments were larger than they were between 1969 and 2015. That's what this thing is happening. People just think about increments going past, and, and they don't realize that you're doubling bases. That some, sometimes soon becomes explosive. Um, coming in ways few expect. First, think tasks, not occupations. And this is actually an old. Um, observation uh, that you guys had way back when, and many people have, have understood it. But many, many people, especially the media, when they write about this, they're talking about which occupations will be eliminated. So you should realize that many jobs will go, but few occupations. I, in, when I was out in Los Angeles, a particularly aggressive journalist was interviewing me, and he said, these five jobs, 
which of them will still be here in five years? And I said, all of them, just fewer people doing them. And I, I, I developed this analogy of farmers and tractors. So tractors changed the nature of the job of farming. And it meant we could grow the same amount of food with fewer farmers. But it did not eliminate farmers or the, the occupation of farming because a tractor is not a baby farmer. And I think there's a lot of systematic misthinking about globalization. You often hear, okay, these RPA can do relatively routine tasks in the back office, but just wait a few more years. We have to calculate whether it's five or 10 years. Then they'll be just like humans and it, like Harari, just a few more years, they will enslave us. So, but that would be like thinking, you know, a tractor is like a baby farmer. He's just in elementary school, but just wait. He'll graduate from college and take over almost everything. Then he'll graduate from, you know, have a PhD and he will enslave all the farmers and he'll have the farmers working for him, the tractor. Well, that's ridiculous, but that's how you should think about AI. This RPAs and the Amelias, they are tools that can do very specific tasks very well. And some of them have broader range than others, but they're not gonna grow up and be uh, an accountant. They're gonna help accountants and they're gonna change the nature of accounting and we're gonna need fewer accountants, but they won't eliminate the occupation. The second is it won't look like Janesville, no mass unemployment Rust Belt style. <clears throat> so Janesville was a book that won a lot of awards, I think in 2017. Um, it was a story about a small town in Wisconsin where a GM factory shut down and one of the suppliers to that factory also shut down. And it traces the misery that came to the communities. The increased suicides, alcoholism, families fell apart, divorce rates went up, people left. It was, it was really a terrible thing, heart-wrenching heart thing. Many people are thinking about the future of job loss due to AI and RI in this terms. They're imagining it. But that's again making the mistake of using the past of the manufacturing sector to project forward the future of the service sector. So you're not gonna see a whole insurance building in London shut down and everybody's fired because the robots and, and uh, telemigrants took it over. That's not the way it's gonna go. I think it's gonna look more like this. How many of you been at a table like that? <laughs> okay. So this is another one of these, these intellectual infrastructures bits that I want you to uh, internalize when you think about the future of, of how AI and RI are gonna come to the service sector. So uh, those of you who are old enough, and uh, I don't know for some reason in, in my audience is the, the, the guys who look like me, probably have the same music taste as me, they tend to be on the left side of the room and the younger people tend to be on the right side of the room. I don't know why that's true, but anyways, for, for those of you who are over here, who, who share my hairstyle, um, will remember when this thing, iPhone, did only three things. When, when Jobs presented it, he was so happy that one device did three things. It was a really good music player. You could have your entire uh, music collection on the phone and it had good quality. It was a very mediocre phone with a short battery life. And it was a web browser that wasn't much good because there wasn't Wi-Fi anywhere. I don't know how many of you guys remember wandering around airports looking for Wi-Fi so you could download your, your emails. Uh, but one convenience at a time, one improvement at a time, it invaded our lives. It became essential to our social uh, networks. It changed the way we relate with our families, with our partners. It changed the way we work with business. It changed the way we interact with our cities physically and the, and the business communities. It's transformative smartphones. But here's the thing. Nobody decided to let that happen. It just happened. And for a long time, we didn't even know it was happening. That's how I think AI and RI will come to the service jobs. Millions of seemingly uncoordinated decisions to replace one worker with a telemigrant or have an extra one or to replace one task with one AI or, or, or software robot. But after just a few years, it will completely transform how we work. But I think lots of people won't realize it's going on. So you may have realized, I think, by analogies. And the analogy I have here is journalism in the city of London. A few years ago, let's say five or six years ago, 
many journalists had good jobs at newspapers with career options, uh, you know, retirement plans, uh, it, and some kind of job security. Lots of them got laid off. There's no mass unemployment among journalists. They just all got downgraded. They're freelancers. They're doing the same thing, getting paid less, and have to be more agile. Some of them are doing stuff on audio or video or whatever. Um, and that's how it's coming. And for a long time, people in the journalist industry didn't really realize it was happening. But now they realize there's been a complete transformation. Now, in fact, the stuff I'm talking about, you can actually see already in one industry called the, this is BLS data, the information industry hires and separations. So those of you who know about uh, labor data, the US has very good data on monthly job creation and job destruction by sector over time, not very good. And what we have here with the dark lines is that this is, with the dashes, that's the total separations. In other words, job destruction. And the total dark, the black dark line there is the total hires. So in the United States, there's about 140 million jobs. And every month, 5 million are destroyed. And every five months, every month, 5 million are created. So there's an enormous turn. And you have to get used to the idea that what's going on in industries is people are creating and changing. And you'll notice that the separations for the informations have followed pretty much the same as the standard. It's the hires that fell. So now there's quite a large gap of employment compared to what it, what it would have been if it hadn't had this deviation. And it started already in 2015, because I, I believe, because information is so intensive here that digital technology is operating sooner and faster in this industry. So this includes like journalism, movies, Google, um, but also uh, basically any kind of media or information services. So there's lots of stuff where you think there would be job creation, but lots of things where you job, job destruction. So job displacement is the business model. Digitech is driving job displacement. Human ingenuity is job, driving job creation. Now, the basic problem here is the AI geniuses are using digital technology to displace jobs. That's the business model. If they want to get, become billionaires in the next three to five years, they have to replace 10% of the nurses, or 10% of the accountants, or half the taxi drivers. That's what they're aiming the, the technology to do, because there is a database about how people do these things. They can train a machine learning to replace some of it, and that's what they're doing now. They are not using the AI to create jobs directly. Some, some jobs are created simply because there's so much data flowing around. Uh, but still, and, and actually some of the offshore jobs are coming back on, on shore, and that's creating some jobs. But basically, you have this mismatch. Mismatch speed is a problem, not the direction. And, and you'll see I'm an optimist in the long run, but a pessimist in the short run. And I think it's because of this. Job creation is advancing at a linear pace, human ingenuity, entrepreneurship, and digital dis, uh, displacement, job displacement, is going at the sort of digital, um, the explosive pace of digital technology, which is rising faster, but eventually will hit diminishing returns, I hope. So in some ways, um, what you have is not so much that it's good or bad, but a question of timing. So we have two groups of people in this, and, and Carl, you probably will have seen this many times. There's pessimists and optimists. Even my sister asked me whether I was a pessimist or an optimist. So pessimists assume we're going to remain here forever. Optimists assume we're going to jump there immediately. So you can understand why I'm both a pessimist and an optimist. I think we have to go through some very difficult times to get to a very good place. But, uh, and, and really, that's what the alarm is. We have to get ready for it. We have to prepare for it. You know, maybe it goes so slowly. Maybe these things are so close together. No, it's no more different than it has been going on since the 70s or the 1700s. But maybe, if some of the higher estimates are true, this could be hundreds of millions of jobs displaced in the next five to 10 years. And that would be something we would have to worry about. OK. So well, I'm going to skip over the automation just because everybody knows about automation. I'm going to try and do uh, telemigration, future globalization, uh, quickly. So here's the argument. Telemigration 
Wage gaps make it profitable. Digital tech makes it possible. So let me just lay this out for you. Globalization is about arbitrage. Whenever prices are different across countries, companies will exploit those differences by making it in one place where it's cheap or buying it and selling it where it's expensive. And since it's a relative price difference, there's always a return trip deal. Buy low, sell high one way, buy low, sell high the other way. That's called comparative advantage in goods. And that worked up, I believe, until about 1990. From about 1990, I think there was an arbitrage in know-how. The know-how per worker was much higher in the G7 countries. In particular, G7 firms had much higher know-how per worker than in the poor countries. And ICT allowed them to offshore parts of their factories and bring along with them the technology which then taught countries like China to make goods that they couldn't possibly have made with their own technology in the time frame they did. So they were arbitraging differences across knowledge. And some of that has been arbitraged away. The big arbitrage in the world that's left is wages, especially of service sector workers. So you will see bookkeepers or accountants or nurses or doctors frequently have a 10 to 1 or 20 to 1 ratio between rich countries and poor countries. Now that has not been arbitraged away because many of these services are considered non-traded. In fact, we trade economists usually just assume they're non-traded. But if you ask yourself, why are they non-traded? It's not always, sometimes it's regulatory, but normally it's just a technical barrier. And just remember that what digital tech is doing, more or less, is making remote people less remote, which will make it easier to arbitrage the wage differences, which will bring globalization to the service sector. So that's the, the basic logic. And I want to go through uh, four steps or four things which I think are important and underappreciated. Domestic telecommuting. I won't ask how many people here are doing des domestic telecommuting because I, I guess a lot of you would put up your, your hands. And in the United States, about 40% do some telecommuting at least once a month. Now here's the thing. You're paving the road to your own replacement. So domestic telecommuting, which is convenient to start with, is leading our companies to change the way you organize work. They're going from you know, the accounting department, the finance department, the marketing department to project and matrix orientation. They're adopting collaborative software like Trello and Basecamp and Microsoft 365 that makes it easier to slot in remote workers. And they're adopting the hardware they need to keep in touch with the remote workers to the extent that they need to make the whole thing work. But once they get it easy to slot in remote workers, it will occur to them that they could get at least some of those skills for one-tenth the price by going on to Upwork and finding people in the Philippines instead of looking around California for the same skills. Now those foreign remote workers won't be quite as good as domestic in-place workers, but they'll be a whole lot cheaper. So what do you think is going to happen? If you want to know where this is going to happen first, you can look at Blinder's calculations and see what he thought would happen. Or you could just look around in the office, who's telecommuting? And if you're telecommuting, say for half your job, at least part of your job is under threat from direct wage competition once this uh, uh, digital technology gets good enough. Probably already is. So in some sense, the container ships that made globalization go so fast in the 2000s what we're going to have now is freelancing platforms do this. The freelancing platforms, Upwork was one of them that you heard of in the video. This is essentially how people will sit in one country and work in another. So these are matchmaking websites, like eBay or Alibaba, but for services. So what eBay did was, if I have something to sell, let's say an English antique table, and somebody wanted to buy an English an antique table, this was a matchmaking service that would put together a buyer and a, and a seller underpin the financial transaction, provide some quality assurance that it would actually be what it is when it got there. Free Upwork, Amazon Turk, Fiverr, Whitmart, these are things that do that for services, not goods. And they're growing very, very rapidly. As I mentioned, Upwork went public last year. And there's a Chinese entrant, a recent one, called Whitmart, which is based on a Chinese service, Chinese language service, which is huge inside China, called Zubaiji. And now they've just launched an English language uh, site. 
advances in telecom, so I don't have to go, go through this, you know, AI and, uh, I'm sorry, RI and VR and a AR and VR and holograms and, you know, it's, it's you've, even in your last few years, you've seen FaceTime get better, Skype get better, so I don't have to go through that. Remote people are less remote than they were before. And the last is machine translation, and I think this is radically under stood, uh, radically understudied and underplayed as to how impactful it will be on globalization. So basically, every kind of international transaction is hindered by language. And for example, if you do a gravity model estimate of how much two countries trade, the kind of model people use to estimate the, uh, the gains from Brexit, including negative numbers, was the gravity model has in it almost always a common language which increases the trade between the countries by 50%. And if you do with investment or any kind of thing, language has an enormous hindrance. Now machine la learning, machine learning made machine translation extremely good starting from the end of 2016. There was an absolute resolution. 2017 was amazing and it's getting more amazing. So what really changed was the UN put online millions of hand translated sentences going back to the 50s in the six UN languages. And then the AI geniuses, starting with Google, estimated one of these enormous models. So now it translates sentence by sentence, not word by word. And so it's become radically better, especially in these big, um, in these big language uh, crossings. And it routinely meets average translators' quality. So in essence, Machine translation is no longer Star Trek. So how many of you have seen Star Trek? Yeah, okay, it's a rhetorical question in an audience like this. How many of you saw it in black and white on a TV? Okay, a few of these here. How many of you know what a TV is? <laughs> it's, it's like a computer monitor, but it's, never mind. So this is, in Google Translate, that's the one I use. It's incredibly good. There's a conversational mode, like I, I was in Tianjin in November. I don't speak Mandarin, but I would speak in English. I would give it to the taxi driver, it spoke Mandarin to him. He spoke Mandarin and spoke English back to me in conversational mode. So it was sequential, it wasn't, was a little, not very uh, quick, but it was incredible and free. It's on all of your laptops if you want it. Skype Translator has an option that most people don't know about. You can speak in English and the guy on the other hand can hear you speaking Spanish. It listens to you, translates automatically into Spanish, and then translates that into spoken Spanish automatically. On YouTube, there's an auto-translate captions. If you touch the gear, if you're listening to one of the major languages, let's say a French language video, it will listen to the French, translate it instantly into English, and put English captions on the foreign video. That's not, they didn't do that in advance, that's going in, in real time. Microsoft translators, for, I have, we have bilingual thing in our, our, in our um, university, and, and so I write my emails in English, I right click and turn them into French and send them off to the administration, and it's pretty good. Not perfect, but if you've ever had dealings with people who speak good enough English, you know, you don't have to be perfect to get most things done. So I think this is gonna lead to a global talent tsunami. Hundreds of millions of talented, low-cost foreigners are excluded from the world service market because they can't speak good enough English. Or, they didn't used to be able to speak good enough English, and now they do, because of machine translation. So in some sense, the story is too bad Adrian Wood isn't here. Is he here? No. Um, the story of the 1990s was hundreds of millions of people joined the manufacturing workforce, low-skilled workers, and that disrupted a lot of things, and we're still paying for that disruption. What's gonna happen in the 2010 is hundreds of millions of service workers, talented people, will be joining the world service market and transforming that as we go forward. Okay, the future of work. Let me see, how, do I have any time left? Oh yes, not 10 minutes, plenty of time for the future. Because um, I'm not gonna go out very far. I don't think it's really worthwhile going out very far because you don't know. And you know, quantum, if, like if quantum computing comes up, that all bets are off, we don't know. So, but I think we ought to think about the next five years, maybe 10 years at the most. So here's what I'm gonna look at it. Um, good news is new jobs will appear as they always have. <clears throat> so I, by the first two chapters of my book, which nobody's written about so far, nobody likes those, but I, I learned a lot by writing about it. I wrote about the great transformation, as Carl Polanyi called it, when we went from farms to factories, 
from uh, rural to urban, um, from uh, land-based value creation to capital-based value creation, from various types of autocracy to various types of democracy. That was the great transformation. And uh, hundreds of millions of humans were killed by other humans in that transition. It was not easy. Um, communism, fascism, and New Deal capitalism arose to deal with this. So that's why they call it the great transformation. And good news is ours won't be quite as great. Um, that went arguably from the early 1700s up till 1970. That's where I draw the line. And that the number of manufacturing jobs in, in the US and many G7 countries were rising until 19, early 1970s and have been falling since. So the second was a service transformation where we went from factories to offices. And I would assert that the locus of value creation moved from capital to knowledge, or some people call it intangible capital, or the OECD calls it knowledge-based capital. But basically, the, the people who control knowledge either in their own heads or firms that have clusters of knowledge, that's the ones who are really creating the value. Now, as you'll see, um, in the first, the first one, the share of jobs, this is US data, but you can see it for all the countries. The share of jobs in, man, in agriculture went from above 60% down to almost nothing. And people weren't unemployed because rising service jobs and rising manufacturing jobs appeared to replace them. Now, one thing, and then when we went from the factories to the offices, and agriculture continued to decline, we got all the service jobs we need. So actually, unemployment right now is quite low despite all these things. Now, I think the interesting thing about that is the first time, they didn't know the names of the jobs that would, cre would be created. And one of the things I often hear and I read about a lot is they say, we can't create the jobs. You know, everything is invented, that, that could be invented, has been invented. So when the robots take over making cars, we'll all be unemployed. But that's really ahistorical. A so when people left the farms, they did not know what they would be doing in the factories. They didn't know they'd be making electric fans because they didn't know about electricity and they didn't know about fans. There was no pharmaceutical industry. Telecoms wasn't a thing. There was no uh, drone operators. There's no uh, life coaches. You know, we invented tons of jobs. They had no idea what they were in the 1800s, but they knew what kinds of tasks they would be doing in the factories. They would be manual, relatively repetitive and they will require a higher level of education than farming. So our countries introduced primary mandatory education, and they taught everybody to read, write, sit down, shut up, and follow instructions, preparing them for the factories. But we didn't know the names of the jobs that they would have, but we knew the skills they would need. And the same thing when the jobs from the factories started declining. We had no idea what all these service jobs would be. But we had an idea of what kind of skills we would need in these service jobs, because the technology was creating better tools for people who work with their heads, and these tools required a university degree to make them work. So we pushed people into higher education to meet the service skills. But we didn't know the names of the service jobs. Nevertheless, they got created. So we should not be asking ourselves now, what are the names of the jobs? Where are we going to get the jobs? Human creativity and ingenuity will take care of that, as it has for the last two or 300 years. Don't worry about it. It will appear. What we have to do is think about what we will be doing in these new jobs. And this is the way I'd like you to think about that. Future jobs. Globots will do what they can. We will do what Globots can't. So the question is, what can't Globots do? And I'm, I'm trying to slip Globots in there as a, as a you know, AR and RI. But in any case, so this is the way you've got to think about it. AI is essentially zero marginal cost. It's like a, a, work, a, a worker that needs a, a manager, but otherwise is free. And RI, telemigrants, they are pretty low cost. So if they can do it, they will do it. So what we have to think about is like a process of elimination. Like Sherlock Holmes, if you eliminate all the other stuff, whatever's left, however unlikely, that's the answer. So let's look at that. McKinsey, by the way, uh, took this, I mean, I, I, uh, McKinsey used this insight, and I think you guys looked, looked a little bit at what, what the task will be left, to ask, what can't AI do? And just to remind you, every day they're telling you what AI can do, 
you know, like robots with soft fingers can now replace Amazon uh, warehouse workers, you know, so interesting. Everybody's focused on that. But you really should be thinking about what it can't do and why it can't do that. So here's my think, way I think about that. So uh, let me just give you what McKinsey said first. So McKinsey did a, a big elaborate study that broke down the US jobs into tasks. They asked AI geniuses what current AI could automate if it was all adopted. You know, we're in transition, so lots of it's not adopted. But if it was adopted, how much of the task could be done? And then they aggregated it up into these uh, seven activities you do in your job. And this is supposedly uh, comprehensive. And the red bars show you what share of hours in the US job market are spent on each of these activities. And you can see they're all pretty much equal except the last one. And then the blue bars tell you what share of those tasks could be automated with current AI. This is from a really nice McKinsey Global Institute report called um, um, a, F a Future That Works or something like that. It came out in 2017. And I like McKinsey Global Institute because they're a little bit middle road. If you talk to the tech guys, they, they, they tend to talk about hundreds of millions in a couple years. And if you talk to the business guys, they say, no, 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 we're just freeing up your best workers for more interesting work. Um, and if you talk to labor economists, a lot of times they say, nah, it's not going to happen. So, uh, but here, what you look at here is predictable physical activities, processing data, collecting data. Over two thirds of those tasks could be automated. So, although the occupations won't be eliminated, about two thirds of the jobs will be uh, eliminated. There'll be general equilibrium, but in any case, the big hit will be on those kinds of skills. And as you go down, it gets less and less and less. And if you get all the way down to developing and managing people, only about 9% of those tasks can be automated given the current state of AI. Now, if you squint hard, what you'll see is the most human activities are the ones that AI can't do. And I spent a lot of time reading about psychology and social psychology to figure out whether that's a fluke or whether it's true. And I convinced myself uh, as, as an amateur sociologist that it's true. And here's a couple of factoids which I think are, are, are useful in thinking about that. So um, our evolutionary superpower as a species is social cooperation. And as, as we know from New College Dunbar, Professor Dunbar, there's a Dunbar no, no, number which humans can cooperate naturally in groups of 150, whereas chimps can only cooperate in groups of 60. And the reason we go to the zoo to watch the chimps instead of the other way around is because we can coordinate in groups of hundreds and fifties and therefore do amazing things, even though we're weaker and slower and almost everything, but we can cooperate. So social cooperation is baked into our evolutionary history, and it goes back even further than chimps, which we broke off from six million years ago. Now, what it means is our brain architecture, a lot of this thinking fast, is social intelligence. And people, different people are, are differently good at it, but social intelligence is something that happens extremely fast, and it's based on what's called the model of the mind. This is what the psychologists call it. So the reason we can cooperate is because, for example, um, let me pick on, on Jan here, so I've, who I've known for a long time. Uh, so I can cooperate with Jan because I have a model of Jan's mind in my mind. And in fact, Jan, having been a dean and cooperated with lots of people, he has a model of my model of his model. Okay, that's two levels. And actually, psycho psychologists do experiments, and they can, you can get up to six levels of reflexivity. Now, with two people, that's complicated, and it's, it's like that movie inflection or something like that. But if you get a group of 10 people, that's a combinatory problem, and it's out the window for computation. And if you go beyond 10, there's not enough atoms in the universe, if they were all computers, to do that kind of computer function. But we do it instantly, effortlessly, because of social genius. So I think a lot of this stuff is using the bits of our brain which are extremely good. The second thing, second insight, is basically structured data is the key limitation. Machine learning is a jet engine driving this automation, but big data is a jet fuel. So the question is, which tasks can't be captured with structured data? Now, structured data means the question is clear and the outcome is clear. So that if you want to visualize it, Go, you go to your job and you do some things. And imagine you open up an Excel spreadsheet and you write down, what am I doing? 
and then you write down what was the outcome, was it good or bad? That would be line one. Now, if you could do that a million times, that part of your job could be replaced by machine learning if it was valuable enough, just because there's a, the, the big data, they can, they can estimate a model to outperform humans usually. But lots of your things you do in your job, I mean, think about your job as a to-do list, and some of the to-do things, it's not clear what the question is, and it's not clear what the outcome is. It's not clear whether it was done well or not. I mean, if you go to a staff meeting or a faculty meeting, for example, there is an agenda, but it's not really clear what the question is. And frequently, it's not clear what the outcome was, <laughs> even though there's minutes. But we all make progress, and we know that we have to do this because that's part of the social cooperation that makes the whole thing work. Now, you could not get a structured data set on faculty meetings which, where the question was clear and the outcome is clear. Therefore, no AI is going to be able to replace what's going on in that room. Therefore, that part of your jobs will exist. And in fact, whatever the new jobs of the future are, we're going to have to be doing a lot more of that stuff. So the most human things, like managing groups of people, motivating people, applying empathy, applying ethics, expressing curiosity, being innovative, dealing with unknown situations. These are the mo human most skills where you can't get a structured data set. Therefore, those tasks won't be automated. Therefore, whatever the jobs are the future, we're going to be doing a lot of that stuff. The most human task. Now, what can't RI do? Now, these are humans. And you can get from doctors, nuclear physicists, all the way down to uh, people who check you into the hotel to come online and do it in, in, in England, even though they're sitting somewhere else. The only thing they can't do is be in the room. And again, if you look at your to-do list of chores, some of the things you have to be face-to-face, -face, or it's, it's much, much easier if you're face-to-face. -face. Some of the stuff you can do on the phone. And when you think about what it is, the stuff where you have to be face-to-face -face is typically somewhat related to that AI stuff, the most human things, where you're dealing with people. Or you may have to actually be in the room with a piece of machinery like lab equipment or whatever it is. So whatever the jobs of the future are, they will, require, they will involve us doing lots of tasks where you have to be there with other people or with machines. Because otherwise, most, much of it will be done by telemigration. So that's the long run future of work uh, in my guessing about what the future will be like. It'll be more human. The jobs we do will be more human. There'll be more local jobs. We'll be richer because of all this automation and globalization will actually make us more productive. We can do more with the same amount of hours. And hopefully we'll be more generous. So, you know, wonderful future. It's like Downtown Abbey where all the grunt work is done by robots. <laughs> so we wake up, all we have to do is decide whether it's a gin and tonic or a glass of sherry before we start our yoga classes or divorce proceedings or write haiku poetry or, you know, whatever. Um, but that's what it's going to be. I think, in general, the direction is very, very positive, And it will change our societies in a way which are positive. And because they're more local, I think communities will become more cohesive as they used to be before people move around, moved around so much. And one, one of the things I've noticed is that people are paying, especially people of our income class, are paying for the experience. So they'll buy a beer, and they'll expressly buy a beer that's made locally because they want to share with that experience, or food that's local. Or they'll, uh, they'll pay more for a taxi driver because they don't want Uber to do that. So people, when they are local, they tend to connect more with their communities. And so I, this is way beyond my pay grade as an economist. But I, I think the communities will, 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 feel, will be better because they'll be more local. And if you want an image of this that exists already, it's companies like Snapchat. And uh, when they went public for billions of dollars, they had like 300 people working together. And they were all in the same building, and they were using lots of AI and lots of RI to do projects. But they were all together cooperating, and they were kind of a team together uh, making things work. And they had very good jobs and all became millionaires, so it's great. The trouble is we have to manage the transition. So Frey and Osborne, here we go, meets Blinder, Alan Blinder. So one of the guys who sung this song about telemigration and you're all going to be competing with foreigners is Alan Blinder. He was a little bit early. He was like where the blue line is above the red line. 
significantly, by 10 years. He said 40% of all American jobs could be offshored. He said anything that could be sent over a wire would be sent over a wire. He wrote an article in Foreign Affairs, called it the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Turned out he wasn't right. But he went through the BLS codes and said which of these jobs is offshoreable or not. And you guys went through the BLS code and says which is automatable or not. And so I got those two and compared them. Um, it got too complicated and I ran out of time. The manuscript was due, so I didn't put it in there. But if you look at that, that's one way of saying somebody should do this. What share of jobs in England are not automatable by Frey and Osborn or whatever twists we're using now and not automatable by Blinder or the latest twists of those? And see which jobs are, are most affected and where they are. You could do like McKinsey thing. Um, I, I, have, I started it but didn't get very far. Okay, conclusions. Um, am I out of time? Oh, I stopped the time. Okay, well, that's, that explains a lot. <clears throat> okay. Um, Globotics is coming faster than most think in ways few expect. It will create a better world of work if we manage the transition. Mismatch speed is the key challenge. We can control the speed. It's our choice. And that's what I want to end with. Many people will say digital technology can't be stopped. It can't be slowed down. And while that's true, it doesn't matter. Because we don't care about digital technology advancing. We care about how it changes our lives. In particular, how it changes our jobs. And every advanced country in the world has laws about firing workers. It's called employment protection legislation. And if there was starting to be big riots, like true social 1920s upheaval, governments could just make it very hard for firms to fire people. And then the companies would implement the AI and the RI slower. So when you say we can't slow it down, that would have horrible consequences. That's the nuclear option. There'd be lots of fallout. But we could slow it down if we want to. So I'll just stop right there. Thank you. So, um, well, if we could stop the time uh, as well, then we would have even more time for questions. But we do have time for questions. Um, There's about 15 minutes or so we could take, I'm sure. I have, I have three things I want to quickly say before we take questions. And the first one is that I want to remind you that this is uh, filmed, this is live webcast. So when you are asking questions, this is also recorded and, and, and broadcast. Uh, the second thing is, can you, because of that, wait until the microphone comes to you and don't try to debate because then it all goes wrong here. And thirdly, um, I will leave it to you then to give whether you want to give structured answer in the spirit of structured data, but I do want structured questions. So if you want to give a comment, <laughs> Please be clear and concise so that a lot of people can put in their comments. So at the very back, uh, please. Uh, thank you for that. Of course, one accepts the general thrust of what you're saying. But can I be a bad fairy at the feast just for a moment? If I think one could take you issue with you on the technical AI stuff. Um, I speak as someone who's put 50 years into this in the very areas you're talking about. And I think you're both too optimistic and too pessimistic. You're far too optimistic because you bought the machine learning Hi, lock, stock, and barrel, and think that 2015 is very different from 2019. It isn't. Machine learning's been around for decades. The talk in AI these days is largely about the limitations on machine learning, the sheer stupidity of it, and the fact that machine learning can't learn from very few exemplars the way we do, but only from vast databases. And that's the huge difference. You're too pessimistic also, I'll stop with this, because several things you said AI can't do, oh, it's been working on for a long time, and it's going to. What you call models of mind, People have written books on this, right. modesty forbids me, but um, books on models of mine, oh yes, there are going to be AIs that know, have models of you and what you're thinking. There have been projects for decades on how to get data from meetings and to have an intelligent participant in a meeting, like a faculty meeting or something, and they're going to come too, so you won't be able to save those either, but I accept much of what you say, but I think the AI technology stuff is wrong about machine learning. I'm just going to take a few more quick yes, comments, because yeah, this yeah, is very much a comment. So please, uh, there behind you. Uh, oh, sorry. And then we'll come to the front. Hi, Greta Corporal, Oxford Internet Institute. Um, I want to challenge you on one point. If we should be afraid if we work from home. And uh, that you say that's kind of the, the precursor of the firm understanding that actually you won't be needed in-house. So we can, uh, we can hire someone uh, in, for instance, in India or something. And uh, actually, based upon the research I do, studying the firms that adopt these platforms, 
it's not that they try to externalize more work outside the boundaries of the firm. No, actually they bring the work back that has already been externalized. And that's actually part of the story that I miss in, in your narrative, is that already for over four decades we have been externalizing service work. It wasn't only manufacturing. And uh, actually a lot of companies are starting to realize the limitations of that and use these platforms to find new models to bring that work back. They don't bring it back in, but the management of the work is being brought back and these freelancers can be brought closer to the firm and actually when you look at uh, the hiring on these platforms, a lot of the hiring is in-country hiring. So it's not only cross-border hiring, but also in-country hiring, yeah. because we do need the high expertise and the contextual knowledge that's often needed for a lot of these jobs. So a couple of challenges there for you to address. Thank you. Can I take a few more? There yes. Yeah. Be very much comments, and there were here in the front too. And let's see states too, and then maybe you can come back in. Yeah. So if you take on your hat as a trade economist, <clears throat> then we often think about general equilibrium effects of what's going on, in particular in your case, what do you think will happen with the wage gap that is driving much of this uh, as these uh, mechanisms go on? And then next yeah. Hi, thank you. Um, I was wondering, what are the implications of, of what you just said for the individual like me? What should I um, uh, look for in my education, say, or in my selection of a job to um, come out as a winner of this whole trend? Okay. So uh, on the tech, tech, thank you for that. Um, I'm not going to pretend I'm a technological uh, genius or uh, expert. Um, thanks. Um, Greta, the, the, the fact that a lot of it's domestic, I agree with that. Most of it is domestic now. Upwork is growing quickly, but it's quite small. And it only went public last year, for example, whereas some of the other things like Mechanical Turk are, are much pr more prevalent. Um, we're talking about the future, which is unknowable. Uh, and you're projecting one forward. I'm suggesting there may be other ways forward. Uh, you guys do research on this, so I'll listen more to you. But I think what, you have to, what we have to say is it's not clear exactly where this is going. And the basic logic of globalization as arbitrage, I think, uh, given how large price differences are, will eventually drive international freelancing to, to an important level. But that's why I say that. But you're basing it on, on the uh, history that's going on, so that's very valuable. Thank you for that. Ian, the wage, gra the wage gap, um, uh, this is not a book about the developing worlds. Uh, and I, I had a chapter, but I decided not to put it in. I'm going to write something in the fall about that. This is a huge export opportunity for the emerging world. In essence, their true comparative advantage in the, in the world is quality-adjusted cheap labor. And up until now, they've mostly had to put that labor in a good and then export the good. And since, a, since goods production is subject to such a large, large agglomeration economies, many of them haven't been able to do this. But like Joseph there, the million Kenyans, that will be an export boom in the middle class of middle income countries. So I think we'll see more emerging markets emerge. Inside the developing countries, it's a bit of a problem because there hasn't been this equalization as there has been in traded goods. So in traded goods, you know, German workers earn far more than Polish workers because they're more productive. But productivity adjusted, they earn about the same. In the service sectors, which aren't traded, the, there's huge differences which haven't been arbitraged because there was no trade in these services and will be. So I think it will be very disruptive. But I think the way it will go is like it did with, with journalists, is we're, we're talking about the service sector, so people are intrinsically more flexible than in manufacturing. So they'll get displaced from whatever they're doing. They'll get re-employed in the service sector, but perhaps at a, at a lower wage. And that will be very disruptive. But people like you and I, who are globally competitive, this is more opportunities. So you, you sell more books. People are watching this online. So my ideas are going further. If, if you're globally competitive, as always with globalization, uh, it's good for the most competitive citizens. It's more competition for the least competitive citizens. So I, I, th I think, uh, at least in the service sector, it will be disruptive um, within, con within countries. I didn't exactly answer your question, but I did talk for a little while, so. <laughs> uh, now, individual preparation. Uh, I was tempted to write this book as Rise of the Robots Meets Self-Help. And my publishers go, no, 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 we don't do that book. So uh, I took out most of the self-help, but I've thought a little bit about it. And in the, in the last chapter, there's 
sort of three rules, I, I say, for personal preparation. The first is the old rules won't work. So the old rules were very simple, get more skills, training, education. That's how you dealt with robots at home in China abroad. Get more skills and, you know, the European Union, the United States, Britain, based their entire national strategies on giving more skills to people. But when you think about why that worked, a lot of it worked because it meant you were going to be working in a sector which was not subject to automation, because computers couldn't think back then, and was not subject to global competition because services were non-traded. And both of those are changing quickly. So the new rules will have to be radically more subtle, more education. If you're, based, if you're learning how to do experience-based pattern recognition, like lawyers and doctors do, you're coming in competition with machine learning, which does database pattern recognition. Those are essentially the same things. So you have to make sure you're not, the second rule is don't compete with AI. Don't do something where you can get a big structured data set, because those will be automated. Don't do things that bring you into competition with RI. In other words, don't think, do things uh, where you can do it remotely, because somebody else can do it, at least part of it, remotely as well. So that ends up with basically soft skills, you know, people, people skills. And I think that will be um, how I would go. Shorter education, more flexible education, get ready to retrain, but have developed the human skills because in this world, humanity is an edge, not a, a, a disadvantage. Uh, the fact that you can't think fast about certain things, that's not a hindrance anymore. Um, Stop there. So can I get, get you to speculate a bit further on the basis of that last, last question? So, um, you know, one of the things is that um, income distribution in countries, they are often quite strongly correlated also with human capital defined in skills distributions, even though we know that some of the skills acquisition can be correlated to wealth because they get better education and so on. This is a form of disruption here because there's another set of skills that may start earning more, more, more returns that at the moment is not necessarily co uh, concentrated with people with wealth, social right. emotional skills and so on. So there's, a, there's another disruption that is possible here. Right, right. So let me take a big running leap on that historically. So I think the technological change that caused great transformation was the development of mechanical power, starting with steam power. And in essence, that gave people who work with their hands enormously powerful tools, gave them huge muscles. And it helped people work with their heads, but only indirectly. So starting from about 1870 to 1970, there was a compression of the income because the technology was giving better tools to people who were at the lower end of the income, and it was helping others, but less directly. From 1970, when it switched over to computerization, computerization, which was all thinking slow, uh, thinking fast computerization, it made better substitutes for people who work with their hands and better tools for people who work with their heads, and you needed a university education to take advantage of those tools. So there was a skill twist which lowered the incomes of people at the lower end, or at least in the middle end, and raised at the top. So since 1970, inequality has been rising. But if you think about this new technology, especially in automation, it's creating substitutes for some types of thinking. So very concretely, you guys, maybe you know Babylon Health. By the way, Babylon Health has both RI and AI on it, and it's, it's advancing extremely fast. So um, think about uh, an AI-trained computer that can diagnose childhood diseases, like simple ones, like Somebody comes in with symptoms and you want to know whether it's an earache or a cold or the flu or meningitis or whatever. Now a nurse running with that AI is enormously more productive than she was before or he was before. The doctor, not much. So a lot of this AI by creating, and the thing that's remarkable about AI is you do not need a university degree to use it. In fact, many of you are using it without knowing it, spell checking, handwriting, it natural language, you speak to Alexa, you're using AI all the time, and you don't even realize it because it's so easy. So I think that we'll start to call AI augmented intelligence because it's giving extra brain power of the experience-based pattern recognition type to average workers. So personally, I think the income inequality will, will get better going forward because of this. And quite explicitly in the book, I speculate that we'll have semi-professional jobs so a class of workers that's between doctors and nurses, or between 
lawyers and paralegals or between architects and draftsmen or engineers and road chiefs because the AI will give these lower, these lower uh, skilled, lower, less trained workers capacities for thinking that they could never have adopted got before, either because of na native skill or lack of education. And they just pull out their computer and they, how much concrete do we put here? You no longer need an engineer for that because the AI will, will do it for you. Or is this child sick, has to go to hospital? The AI will do it. Babylon Health will do it for you right now. So I, I think it will be equalizing. Yes. That's part of my happy, happy ending. Excellent. Um, let's do quickly one more round. Let's, uh... Right. Yeah, we'll go forward. I will take three or four, and I'm afraid I have to be the last group. Yeah. Daniel Scharf, right, I'm wondering what human intervention there might be for making choices in all this, because particularly the area of automated war, we are thinking of making choices. I wonder in what other areas we might be thinking of interfering with this inevitability. Uh, three quick things. One is digitization and the compression of hardware, effectively, right? Everything's getting smaller, it's disappearing, software is eating the world. How does that kind of play into these supply chains and issues uh, as we look at that? Second thing is psychology. Uh, human beings, convenience, how we start to adjust to new realities. There's empathy robots now. Um, how do we, you know, we think AI is only not not going to be able to do some of the human stuff. We're already now seeing that 10 years from now, God knows what AI will be able to do, right? Mm. So I don't want to, you know, I think I challenge how much we can assume AI won't know forever. Mm. It might be slower at times, it might be faster at times, but there's progress uh, in that direction. And the third is productivity, because we base productivity very much on a human measure. And I think as we become so digitized, how does the concept of productivity change and how do we measure that? Mm. At the core of what you're saying is um, asymmetric information, and you're basically saying that asymmetric information can be greatly reduced um, in this world. I'm, I'm slightly worried because I think there are limitations to this, and trust is part of um, reducing asymmetric information. But, of course, in the world, we have scammers, we have IP thieves, mm. we have cybersecurity risks. Um, isn't the technology itself developing you know, kind of antibodies that, that will limit the uh, usefulness of the technology? Right. And we have one more. Sorry, who was it? Uh, it was there, yes. And then why don't you take them, the one just behind there as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is whether you think there's an inherent clash um, in between the growth of AI and ROI. So if you look at the kind of task that we um, automated first, a lot of that is the work that the um, Kenyan million um, workers would potentially be using, been doing through Upwork and things like that. So do you think that there would then be an impact on those um, sort of cohorts of potential workers? Yeah. Right. Just behind you, yeah. And could you speculate a little further on the uh, personalities, culture, and values that might come from the technological emergence? Right. That's great. Uh, Let me go through those. Uh, I can reserve more, take more. There's, so the culture and, and the, the trust and the psychology, let me, let me put those a little bit together and admit that this is way above my pay grade as an economist. Uh, but you asked me to conjecture, and you're sitting there nice, politely, so I'll, I'll give it a go. Um, so let me start with a story. There's, a, there's a, a professor at MIT in the media lab called Alison Darling who writes about human-robot interactions. And she tells a story, she has a great TED talk, about what's called the, the hitch bot. So it was a robot which no arms and no legs couldn't move but could talk and interact with humans. And they put it by the side of the road and said, you know, please me, bring me to Las Vegas. And people would take care of this thing. And they liked it and they would pass it on until one time they lost control with it and they eventually found it completely dismembered. Somebody had gotten angry at the thing and then destroyed it. And I think to a certain extent, that's how, right, right now, AI is kind of fun and cute. And if you look at people who do robotic process automation or they work with Amelia, they give them pet names and they, they personify them. But I think we will be giving them names, but not um, good names. It, very soon. So I, I think that, can, that culture right now is very accepting and, and personifying, but it could change. 
Now, how it will actually change things, I, my conjecture is it will have more local, more human jobs, so it will be better people um, and more cohesive. It will be more of the social matrix that you see in a village. That's what I'm hoping for. Um, the productivity, a lot of it's a question of how you measure it, and, and that's, uh, again, lots of written about it. I think lots of value creation is not measured. A lot of this stuff is zero-valued goods, which is hard to measure, and once it gets to zero price, it, you can't use the quality adjustment procedures we usually do, so I think lots of it's missing. But uh, that, again, that's a, a, a broader discussion, which I don't talk about. The supply chain, that's interesting, and it's in the goods world. In essence, automation worldwide is reducing the labor cost share in manufacturing, and eventually it will make manufacturing non-traded. Because if you only have 5 or 10% labor cost, it's not worthwhile making it on the other side of the world. You make everything local, and that started already. Um, privacy, trust, I, you know, I, I, I think this, that's one of the reasons upheaval is the second word in my title. And my guess in the book as to what the upheaval will be against, the backlash, is big tech. And I think people will f feel, for a variety of reasons, they're manipulating our children's minds, they're deciding what hate speech is, they're deciding who gets to use our data, who elected them, uh, and on top of it, our jobs are being displaced by big tech. Actually, it's not them, but at, we're going to be doing this at a level of, of understanding and politics where I think it could all get put together into a big thing. And there's a presidential candidate called Andrew Yang running right now on that platform of anti-tech. He has a wonderful, you know, um, Andrew Yang for President 2020 video, and you've got to watch it. I showed it to my wife, and she goes, oh, yeah, I'd vote for him. Um, <laughs> you know, about the rich guys and displacing the jobs, sending them overseas, automating these things. Uh, and just think, he's not going to get elected, although he will sell a lot of books, which I suspect is what it's all about something I can understand. Um, <laughs> but in any case, uh, I think the left-leaning Democratic candidates won't be able to resist that because there is an underlying anger and fragility that people have, and the right has channeled it against migrants and China. And the left will have to acknowledge it and will like to channel it, I think, against big tech. So I think there's a reasonable good chance that your issues of trust and privacy and the police forces using it and China doing all these social credit, that could lead to a bit, bit of a backlash. Um, it, it, I think probably it'll be an element of the 2020 U.S. election. If, um, so that's, that's where choices, warfare, yeah. One of the craziest things in the world is we don't have a Geneva Convention of digital anything. Um, and I, I, they were talking about a treaty, like land, we have one on landmines and poisonous gases and nuclear, but nothing on autonomous weapons, which is a real issue. So I think that's just amazing. The British government doesn't have a ministry of AI or technology, but they do have a department of agriculture that's very well funded. <laughs> and they have one on fisheries. Um, so it, it, I think we're a little bit behind on the governance of this, but especially the, the autonomous weapons is, is uh, something I, people, a lot of people know a lot about this. I, uh, uh, worry about big time, and I, I think that is an issue, but we, we got to catch up with it. And the trouble is it's so easy to use, like the drones. You put drones with little facial recognition and let a swarm of them go, give them one bullet each, that could, you know, and that's something that does not require state uh, capacity, so it's scary stuff. It's not in the book, though. <laughs> right, so, um, well, it's, it's, it's very striking, the kind of note where, we, where we're coming to. Uh, yesterday, we sat in the same room here. It, the lights were a bit more dimmed. Everybody was wearing a gray suit, and everybody was deeply worried, and this was a cybersecurity conference. Um, it, this is here a room where people are wearing definitely much more colorful clothes, and uh, the light is very bright. So there's a bit of optimism in, in the air here as well. I want to um, say also one more thing. Um, you know, I wouldn't have agreed to, to chair this if I couldn't very quickly plug that in Blatnik School of Government. We're working with a group of people in a commission that's called Pathways for Prosperity. We're actually inspired also, including with some of these ideas, we're trying to look at what these kind of movements could potentially mean for the developing world. So if you want to reach out to us there, we are looking for more ideas and things further about it. 
Tomorrow, I think there is a talk here as well. Uh, we're going to get, uh, so Carl Fry talking about saving labor automation and its enemies. Uh, so I'm not sure it's going to be people brightly dressed or a bit more darker, but probably a bit of both. A bit of both, we'll see that. Um, but this is not the end of it, um, because I would like to invite you all to um, have a drink next door here. And uh, Richard will be, um, well, he's still an economist, he will be selling his books and signing them. So anyway, but thank you very much, Richard, for, uh, for taking the time here. Thank you.